before we start this video, I just want to say there's a police siren that uh, tried tuning out as best as I could, but it's still in the audio. It ends about um, two and a half minutes in, and I also hiccup a couple times in the video, which is just funny to me. But anyway, let's get started with the video and jump right in. Whenever I refer to my spirituality, in other words, the way I relate to a higher power, the very first thing that comes to mind is ethics. What is the use of taking care of ourselves if everyone and everything else is irrelevant? Not acknowledging this, I believe, is a misunderstanding of the way the world works. We are all interdependent, so what affects me affects you, and back and forth. So when we take action for the benefit of, of another, we create a chain of events which promotes helpful causes and effects to ripple throughout the universe. And vice versa, taking selfish, negligent actions creates that sort of effect in the world. Specifically, my personal practice is firmly rooted in caring for animals and the environment which is an intersection of deep ecology and veganism. Today I want to talk about a historical guru of yoga named Dathatriya, who emphasized these ethics in the practice he recommends to others. I connect with him immediately because ethics are not always emphasized in spiritual modalities, including those considered under the umbrella of yoga. I feel that ethics and continuously questioning the ones we hold and practice are important today more than they ever have been. It's the reason we're in such a self-centered conundrum, destroying this planet, which is our only habitat, and for all the other beings upon it. So the historical text attributed to him, called the Dathatriya Yoga Shastra, was the earliest Hatha Yoga text. Most people actually don't remember it when talking about Hatha Yoga. It was written around the 13th century CE, and it teaches an eightfold yoga very similar with Patanjali's eight limb yoga. Much of Hatha yoga tradition actually started with 17th century Vajrayana Buddhism and later predominantly became rooted in the Nath, aka Shaiva yoga traditions. But Dattatreya was unique because his teachings were rooted in the Vedic Vaishnava system. Vaishnava meaning the group which reveres Lord Vishnu, the god of life, as its central deity. Other differences with general Hatha Yoga themes is that it's not lineage-based, and because of its Advaita Vedanta roots, it acknowledges that everything is our teacher. Also compared to other Hatha Yoga, which focuses solely on the individual, this one does do that, and it talks about bringing our attention to the other beings in the greater whole as well. So it's both individual and collective focus, showing its core acknowledgement of interdependence. The similarity it does sh share with other Hatha Yoga texts is that it focused on regulation of personal pranic energy to connect with the greater universal energy. What I see is that Dathatriya had the means to f attain full transcendental liberation from this world, but out of compassion he chose to remain within it to help others that are suffering. In Mahayana Buddhism, this is considered the Bodhisattva path, when one who has developed something called Bodhicitta, aka enlightenment mind, to help in awakening and spreading compassion for all sentient beings. That shows a core thread of Buddhist thought in Hatha Yoga through the Dathatriya Yoga Shastra. Here I have a poster of Dathatriya also called Sri Guru Dattatreya. These prefixes just venerate him. And there are many Hindu idols, but I would like to show you how to identify Dattatreya. He will often be seen with three heads, one for Brahma, one for Vishnu, and one for Mahesh, also called Shiva. And he's often seen wearing ascetic renunciate clothing. Other Hindu deities you'll see are often dressed um, very opulently and sometimes also like this. So he has also six arms, two for each of these idols. The lotus and the water pot represents Brahma, the spinning wheel and the conch shell represents Vishnu 
and the trident and this spinning hand drum double-sided also goes with Shiva but it isn't depicted in this one what is depicted is the Ganga River here and you can see that it's coming atop from the bun usually if you look at images of Shiva he has that coming from his bun and if we zoom in that's her little head painted and we have Vishnu at the center because he comes from a Vaishnava perspective so that's why Vishnu is who he centrally represents then he also is depicted with a cow and four dogs so the cow represents the mother earth and here this representation of him he's feeding mother earth aka caring for her which is why I like this depiction and the four dogs represent the four Vedas so the Atharva Veda, the Yajur Veda, the Sama Veda and the Rig Veda I did not say those in order by the way so yeah and he's also shown in nature and that's how you can identify him why I find him so interesting is because he didn't learn his practices from another guru which as I mentioned means he's not part of any particular lineage this is pretty unique because the way that many gurus both historically and even today are given validity in their knowledge is based on which lineage they have learned from. For example, you've heard of Dayangar, Krishnamacharya, or Pratabi Joyce lineages perhaps. A guru is someone that a disciple essentially honors lovingly in a similar way one would love God. One relies on their guru for life teachings about spiritual attainment and realization of capital T truth. By the way though, we can always hold the nuance that a guru may not know every single thing or be completely perfect because they are human after all and we shouldn't be putting anyone on too high of a pedestal. It creates an imbalance of power which can occasionally lead to our love and vulnerability being taken advantage of. So then, who did he learn spiritual lessons from? His teachings were other beings and the natural world around him. I feel like this is so relevant today because most of us don't necessarily have a guru of our own and we learn from whatever or whomever resonates with us. Dathatreya teaches that beneath it all, no matter how separate things may seem, there is an underlying unity. And this is hidden from us, but our experiences within the world contain the seed for us to learn this truth. This emerges from recognizing that the world is inherently ever-changing and bound by the effects of this change, whereas Brahman or spirit is steady and eternal. Now let's briefly mention all 24 of his gurus. They are the earth, wind, sky, fire, water, the moon, the sun, some pigeons, a python, the ocean, a honeybee, a beekeeper, an elephant, a deer, a fish, a prostitute, a small squirrel, a child, a hawk, a young housewife, an archer, a snake, a spider, and a wasp. What do these even share in common? They're all different manifestations of the divine, meaning that everything has something to teach us due to our collective underlying unity. I'm gonna highlight five of these and interpret them for the modern context. Number one, the earth. He teaches that it is steadfast in its duties and cycles. It teaches us to be steady even in the face of aggression, and to simply focus on our own work. So Earth is a great teacher of dharma, or the value of responsibility and perseverance within a greater system. Today, because Earth is so wise in her duties, we can learn to biomimic her cycles and rightfully return our human ways to actually fully be a part of them again. And number two, fire. Dadatura notices that knowledge is the fire within the teacher which they pass on to their student. That fire burns away lies and delusion. And something striking that he says here is that we shouldn't consider the quality of the teacher, but only the quality of their teachings. Which goes back to what I was saying earlier about understanding that gurus are not perfect godlike beings, but the teachings are. So the same way that sharing fire is endless, since one flame doesn't diminish from lighting another, 
What can we learn from that today? It is to remember that it's only knowledge which can collectively liberate us. So don't be afraid to keep learning and growing and speaking up about it. Number three, the Aerosmith. Dathatriya notices one engaged in their craft and learns that we should be so focused on our pursuit that we're unaware of whatever ruckus is going on around us, just like them. That's how focused we should be on discovering the spiritual truth, actually. For the modern context, I believe we can understand this as the state of flow, which is the way of merging with the divine. I actually made a video on this, which you can check out here. Uh, but it also reminds me of certain scenes from the movie Soul, if you've seen it, where musicians would get so deep in their art that their consciousness would enter a metaphysical realm between spiritual and physical reality. Moving on, number four, bees. That that they observe that they take only what they need from a flower with wise discretion, limiting their material benefits from the world and living lightly upon the earth. They also live to fulfill their duty by serving others in their hive. Today, we can learn to practice living lightly like bees do by limiting consumption of what we don't need and being present with the materials we do accumulate to understand how much they even fulfill us. This can look like choosing minimalism, buying secondhand as often as possible, or just truly valuing what we already own. These also teach us today that we can find fulfillment in service towards others because we often get lost when we are only focused on ourselves. Number five, the beekeeper. This is the one I found rather curious because for the rest, that other recommends us being more like them, but this one we should actually be less like. And this is because the beekeeper uses bees for personal profit. Meanwhile, bees work themselves to death to store energy for their community in the form of honey. Did you know that a honeybee visits around 2,000 flowers in their lifetime but only makes a teaspoon of honey? Yet the beekeeper just steals that in exchange for sugar water, which lacks the antibacterial and antifungal properties that they need for their vital health. It's like if we started farming squirrels for their instinct to gather acorns just to steal their hibernation stash. Honeybees are actually just one out of 20,000 bee species around the world. And since human agriculture is so heavily reliant on pollinators, bringing them everywhere we grow food is spreading an invasive species. Bees are also experiencing colony collapse disorder, which is intimately linked with the way we see them as livestock and not wildlife of their own. I'd like to read a quote to you from this journal article called Deep Ecology Education, Learning from its Vaishnava Roots. Egoistic environmental values predispose people to protect environmental attributes that affect them personally. Altruistic values express concern for the environment in terms of its impact on the welfare of human society, aka shallow or socialist ecology. Biospheric environmental values concern the whole biosphere and all life, a position sometimes called anti-human, elitist, and occult. So biospheric environmentalism is a recognition that humans are a part of a larger whole, which is also a living, breathing entity, you know? It's Mother Earth or Gaia or perhaps just the biosphere. And we play a critical role towards its overall health. Deep ecology is formally attributed to the ecosophist Arne Ness in the 70s, but it was written about by Rabindra Tagore and Gandhi before that as well. Ness was critically informed about Vaishnava philosophy, and so there's that link between Gandhi and Dathatriya's Vaishnava roots. And Deep Ecology acknowledges that we constitute equal value within the biosphere and that we have a duty to question our power within this sphere. Currently, the world is ruled by human supremacy. Just like white or cis hetero supremacy, we must also deconstruct our immense sense of power about being born human into this world. They call this anthropocentrism, but it's parallel to the division understood as speciesism in animal rights. Deep Ecology also says that in order to awaken to spirit, we need to cultivate a personal relationship with nature. Mm -hmm. 
So I have a few recommendations about how we can even do that. So the first thing would be to do something each week or a few times a week that gets you to deeply connect to nature. I don't just mean taking your dog for a walk in the park. I mean thoroughly absorbing nature's beauty or balance or lack thereof through a conscious awareness and active presence with it. Wow, did you hear that? <laughs> this can look like gazing at a leaf and forgetting about time or standing in some light rain and feeling the rhythm of droplets on your skin or just gazing at your skin closely in the sunlight. I actually tried that one recently a couple months ago and the sun brings out so many colors in our skin, it's truly fascinating. Number two would be examining our role towards creating a greater balance. Read about ecosophy or deep ecology. Generally contemplate why humans believe they can do absolutely whatever they want to do to nature. I'll put some recommendations for books and articles in the description of this video. At the same time, I do want to acknowledge that most of the contributors towards climate change are fossil fuel companies and large banks, including Chase Bank. So many of these are systemic issues, but we can also boycott those institutions as much as possible. And here we go. The next one might be a controversial one, but it really shouldn't be. Gradually work towards living the vegan ethics. Since this video is about ecology, I recommend that you take some time to research how the diet portion of veganism lessens our impact on the earth. I can get you started with some stats in the description as well, but since veganism is mainly about our relationship with animals, realize the connection between how we treat animals and the way we treat the planet, because we objectify them, and that is the intimate link between environmental veganism and animal rights. So for those who may question, don't we have to objectify plants to eat them? Well, plants don't have pain receptors the way animals do. And calorically, it takes feeding a cow, for example, nine times the amount of edible calories to simply receive one calorie from their flesh or milk. We are vastly using more land to grow animal feed than we even need to feed ourselves. Now, don't get caught in the black and white thinking. Caring for the environment doesn't mean removing ourselves from the planet just because our existence consumes resources but it is about how we can reduce our impact as much as possible. And if that the thrill was alive today with the abundance of options available to us, I assure you, he too would be vegan. Practice gaining something called material literacy. That's the fourth one. If we want to live in a circular economy where recycling is efficient and reliable, we need to understand what materials we're looking at, especially when it comes time to not only dispose of what we don't need, but when we are shopping for products that we'd like to buy. So that looks like holding a coffee cup and being able to distinguish whether the cup is lined in plastic or wax, recycling the outer paper holder, unless it's soiled, in that case it goes in composting, and figuring out which types of plastic your local municipal recycling plant accepts. And generally just giving value to what enters in our life. What happens now is that in the Western lifestyle, we overconsume and we force materials through a linear pathway. But as that that there teaches, we can learn from Mother Earth and work within her cyclical material pathways. I'll put a resource to that to learn more about material literacy in this description as well. So thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate that you stuck around until the end of this video. And of course, I'll be putting all the sources that I mentioned in the description if you're interested. It's always so great to continue learning and growing and improving ourselves as human beings upon this planet and, you know, biospheric environmentalism, right? Just really embracing that we are part of a greater whole that Mother Earth has gifted to us. <laughs> so thank you. I hope you stick around and subscribe to my channel and like the video if you appreciated it or learned anything new and yeah thank you so much